this is the only technology I have to deal with this week. Uh, How's it working? Seems to be working. <laughs> so you, some could say a miracle happened this week. <clears throat> I actually lost the hard drive on my fancy expensive iMac on Monday and then two days later I, my work computer blew up and the battery swole up and burst the uh, swelled up and and burst the screen out of the front of it and so that's why I'm here basically with nothing <laughs> other than my notes you want to borrow a flannel around? But, but that's it <laughs> yeah I got a whiteboard too <clears throat> So anyway, I, I think uh, God, by God's grace it will be sufficient to get the message across. And one of the things I'm going to do, uh, which I've been trying to do, but this time I'm going to be very clear. We're going to zoom in to the Bible, see what the Bible says about the topic first, and see what we can deduce from that before we start zooming out to other wider things um, and again, the goal of this class is to discuss and to figure out where, our, where as Christians we need to, to be positioned to be able to give good arguments for unbelievers and for people that don't believe the same things that we do uh, and why we believe what we believe. Uh, <clears throat> so the first thing that you'll hear from a, a, a skeptic is miracles don't happen. All right. How many of you believe that miracles happen? Almost everybody, right? And why do Christians believe that miracles happen? Jesus. Yeah, you kind of have to. But when you really think about it, there are certain things in the Bible that are miracles undeniably to most of us. And skeptics have ways to discount those things as being mistaken or misunderstood. And so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about those things. Uh, <clears throat> there's also a lot of uh, what I would call like back-channel worldview that comes into even Christians' lives through the media, through television, movies. Uh, I don't know if you all remember, there used to be a show called The Great Mysteries of the Bible. It shows up every once in a while on reruns. Uh, it's an illustration of this where every week they go to explain uh, how this or that miracle of the Bible is really just a case of mistaken identity. What's described as a miracle is reinterpreted by that show as being some unusual natural event perceived by the mind of ancient men as a miracle. And the reason, uh, is, the reason for that is, after all, we generally don't observe miracles. You know, what I described to you before is a miracle could be a very un unlikely occurrence, but it could be explained through naturalistic processes. Like my hard drive was spinning for five years, it was bound to heat up and burn up something, or my batteries were defective and they had some contaminant in the chemicals and that's what caused it. And they just happened to coincide on the same week, okay? Is that a miracle? Probably not. Unless Satan or God were trying to influence something through natural means to get me to give up or to say something or you know who knows or so they end on a bang yeah or end on a bang <laughs> exactly so let's let's start by looking at uh, some bible descriptions of supernatural events and how that relates to to god uh, there are mighty works and miracles done in the bible all throughout uh, we start seeing major uh, major miracles described in Exodus, uh, particularly in association with Moses. Um, in Exodus 8, uh, the Pharaoh asked Moses to pray for him and, and his people tomorrow. And this was right after the plague of the frogs. So the frogs had sort of given Pharaoh the idea that maybe there is something to Moses. And Moses said, it will be as you say so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. Later in Exodus, uh, God says, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight 
you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be fulfilled with you will be filled with bread, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And uh, l later, later on, uh, God says, to, "This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that He will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, all the other ites in the Old Testament." Uh, <clears throat> So those three scriptural verses have one thing in common. It's so that you will know that I am the Lord. You will know that I am God. Number two, God gives uh, miracles as answers to prayers. Uh, answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. That's uh, David's prayer in 1 Kings, I believe. Uh, Isaiah 45.3 I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you know that I am the Lord, God of Israel, who summons you by name. Uh, in Joel, then you will know that I am in Israel, for I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. So again, they're both an answer to prayer and an assurance that the Lord is. Uh, God sometimes uses miracles to assist human endeavors in Zechariah. Uh, the hands of Zer Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. <clears throat> Jesus used miracles to heal, uh, to make corrections, and to be mat comp compassionate and merciful to people. Uh, Matthew 9, 6, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, take your mat. And walk home. John 10, if I do it, even though you don't believe me, believe these miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and that I am in the Father. Again, it points back to the Father. So sec, uh, next category of miracles are to, to add to the faith and to confirm that God's message comes through Jesus. Uh, and there's there's a, even some back back in Genesis, I mean uh, back in Exodus, uh, <clears throat> where uh, um, where Moses uh, was basically having a discussion with God and said, "Well, what if they won't listen?" All right, uh, this says the Lord is so that they may believe that the Lord, the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. The Lord said to Moses later in Exodus, Exodus 19. Uh, and this was three months after the Israelites had gone into the wilderness. I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told, told the Lord what the people had said. So did it work? <laughs> did the people always trust him? <laughs> you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. This is an Isaiah. And this, this is the Isaiah 43 prophecy. Uh, and my servant who I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor, there will, be there, nor will there be one after me. Uh, again, uh, uh, forecasting Jesus. Uh, and later in John, uh, for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, Jesus is saying to uh, friends of Lazarus. Because I have something really amazing in store for you. Uh, so that you may believe. So let's go to him. And so after uh, the answer to prayer was what confirmed Jesus' mission uh, later on in that same chapter. I know that you always hear me as Jesus speaking in his prayer. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Again, pointing back to the Father. Uh, also, prayers are to, to confirm God's presence in fulfilled prophecy. Uh, John 13, 9, I'm telling you now before that it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. John 14, I've told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you'll believe. And John 19, this is regarding the fulfillment of the prophecy that not a, a bone in Jesus' body will be broken. The man who saw it has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you may believe. And finally, G miracles confirm Jesus' sonship and authority from God. 
Jesus did many other miraculous signs of the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. So a lot of that was to God's people. There are very few of those that were directed to skeptics or even Old Testament skeptics, if you will. Uh, it was more like an assurance of faith and, again, a, a pointing to the nature and person of God. Who, who is God? Uh, the Bible is also not, uh, you know, Pollyanna unrealistic about miracles. Uh, as we know, counterfeit miracles can be used for deceit. You remember the, uh, the Pharaoh's magicians could duplicate the snake or any of the, uh, the, snake, the staff turning into a snake, any of the miracles that uh, Moses said, this is from God, the Pharaoh's magicians were able to duplicate that. <clears throat> in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. And also, the Bible suggests that dependence on signs and miracles for faith uh, betrays unfaithfulness. Okay, so uh, John 6.30, Jesus answered and said, The work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. So they asked him, the Pharisees, uh, or the crowd, that is, What miraculous sign will, then, will you give then that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Okay, Jesus just told them what they needed to know. Well, they, they started out by saying, we don't believe you. Prove it. You know, show us something miraculous. And then later on in Matthew, <clears throat> uh, the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for miraculous signs, but none will be given except for the sign of the prophet Jonah, which was three days in the bowels of the earth and then rising again. That's a pretty big miracle. And as I'll suggest later, we'll talk about that particular miracle. So we can see from this kind of real quick dive into Scripture that uh, miracles had four main purposes in Scripture. Number one, to affirm the existence, identity, and providence of God. To confirm the truth and authority of God's Word, however it's received. To, as a means of strengthening and uh, affirming the faith of the believer. And to test to testify to the authority of Jesus as the Son of God and as, and as the Savior. Any questions? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so now we have a good biblical understanding of miracles, I think, as, as quick as we can get in uh, to that. And we're going to jump back out again and talk about uh, why skeptics don't believe miracles and thus why they believe the Bible is false. Uh, first of all, I would say it's because uh, skeptics have a naturalist worldview. Uh, there's a philosophy called naturalism, and that's encapsulated in that comment that Carl Sagan uh, famously said in the movie, uh, in, in the, uh, the TV series Cosmos, was that the universe is all there ever is, all there ever was, and all there ever will be. That's the cosmos, which meant that there, he rejects anything that's above or outside or beyond the universe. In fact, there's a term for talking about things that are above or beyond or beside uh, that which we know called metaphysics. It's outside or beyond or superseding physics. And naturalism basically rejects metaph metaphysics or metaphysical explanations insofar as anything, any kind of outside relationship. There's a, there's a, a scene in, uh, in Contact, which is a Carl Sagan, based on a Carl Sagan book, that I didn't, didn't get the chance to play because my computer broke. But <clears throat> You're going to reenact it? Yeah, I'll reenact it, yeah. <laughs> Good suggestion. <laughs> so, uh, Ellie, Dr. Airway, <laughs> she's in a discussion out on the balcony with uh, uh, Matthew McConaughey's character, who's, who's sort of a slimy preacher kind of a guy anyway, but he does say a few good things every once in a while. 
uh, they, they kind of set him up to be a, a buffoon in the movie so that we'll all know that you know religious people are not very smart. But every once in a while, the producer of this movie sneaks something in that wasn't in the book, and this is one of those things. Uh, the, Ellie says, well, have you ever heard of Occam's razor? And the preacher goes, no. And she says, uh, well, Occam's razor says probably the simplest it means that out of all the explanations for something that happens that we don't understand, probably the simplest explanation is true. And he looks kind of stumped by that for a minute. And then he turns around and he looks back at her and he says, tell me this, did you love your father? And then as, if you've seen the movie, you know that's really a, a hot button with her, you know, as... Uh, her dad died because she felt like she didn't get to him in time and that the preacher explained it as God's will, which is really a horrible thing to say to a little girl who just lost her father from a heart attack. She figured that because she didn't get to his medicine in time that it was her fault that he died. But then again, with, with her eyes tearful, she says, yes, I did. And he says, prove it. Okay? And so... Then the movie cuts to another scene. And I thought, wow, that really stuck out of my head. There's another scene, too, at the end of the movie. I'll tell you about sometime when we got time to talk about it. But uh, it kind of put a couple of holes in Carl Sagan's naturalistic philosophy. But then again, uh, <clears throat> that, that philosophy believes that the nature and the structure of the universe consists only of natural elements, of material elements, matter and en energy, and concepts that exist uh, 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 in the human brain or anything that exists outside of the human brain is somehow eminent or part of the structure of the universe. Okay, So even things that we can't explain have got to have some natural explanation. So it rejects the mir miraculous and the supernatural. Uh, it's also important as a methodology for science. Uh, if you there, there's a distinction between naturalist philosophy or naturalism as a philosophy and methodological <laughs> naturalism, which is what scientists have to do to do science. And a lot of times the arguments between science and scripture get confused because scientists say, we can't have miracles happening all the time or we couldn't do science, we couldn't explain anything. Um, and the you know, the theist will say, well, no, we can rely on, you know, the laws of nature and that that's part of God as well. So this, uh, this philosophical naturalism is something that gets kind of uh, extrapolated from methodological, methodological naturalism so that people uh, start to take that as a worldview. And so they, they come to the conclusion because of that that things can't happen that are miraculous. Uh, secular humus, humanists, if you've heard of humanism or secular humanism, uh, that's basically their philosophy. And then, the, then on the other hand, there's supernaturalism, above naturalism or beyond naturalism. Supernaturalism accepts a metaphysical dimension that supersedes nature and is not subject to direct observation. And obviously theism or belief in God is intrinsically supernatural. So if you believe in God, you can't be a naturalist. There's a philosophical problem that can't be resolved, can't be blended, can't be concorded. So it's not surprising then that... Uh, now, now we're going to talk about what actually is a miracle. Okay, what's the definition of a miracle? Uh, it's not surprising then that temporary definitions of miracles characterize them as violations of the laws of nature. In fact, that there, the fact that there are orderly laws of nature in the beginning is actually evidence for an intelligent designer. And ironically, it reinforces the idea of a God who masterminded creation, but who took little personal interest in the affairs of people. And I think that's what um, a lot of folks in this class are, are really worried about. When we come up with scientific explanations for certain things in the Bible that appear to me miracles, it discounts this idea that God is involved in his creation and that he's active. And it's very clear 
that the Bible tells us something different from that. Yeah. God uses the natural sometimes to produce the supernatural, to manifest the supernatural. Indeed. Indeed, he does. And I'm going to go ahead and, and take that as an opportunity now to make a distinction between miracles and other acts of God that I will call providence or providential. Okay? And I don't know if you've thought about that, but this deal with my computer, my computer's both blowing up, all right? It forced me to go back and read my notes and do a little background research. And I actually spent a lot more time looking at the material this week than I did uh, when I have a fancy slide presentation to show it all because I have to describe it to you verbally. Um, I could say that that is providence, that God used those forces of nature to accomplish something that he had intended through me. Or I could say it was Satan, which is what my wife thinks, <laughs> taking, throwing shots at me, you know, to say, hey, we want to discourage you from doing this. I don't know. But either way, uh, it does say, and, the, and it's clear also in the Bible that God uses natural events, you know, fire from heaven, hailstorms, floods. You know, God uses natural events to accomplish his will. And it's very clear that he intervenes in his world. And so the, the idea that a God sits back, uh, as I've said before, like a, an owner of a spinning top and sets the universe free and just watches like this, that's called deism. And if you've heard like our founding fathers were supposedly believers and Christians, well, most of them were deists because they happened, that happened during the 18th century and the, and the 17th century enlightenment going into the 18th century. Uh, those were all, uh, that's when that whole idea got started. And people actually felt that they could understand everything that happened and that God really didn't play with the buttons and knobs of the universe. Would you say that conviction from the Holy Spirit is providence? I would say conviction from the Holy Spirit is supernatural. Absolutely. Because it, it's an outside agent. Uh, a, a skeptic would say that it's just your mind playing tricks with you. It's wishful thinking. But we know that's different. And true, it's very subjective. You can't prove supernatural interference or inter intervention. You can't prove providence. You can't even prove miracles. And I'll use this as an example. Okay. Um, <clears throat> There is a scientific occurrence that's very natural that we know. It's, it's, we have laws that predict it, but it goes against every law of physics that we knew before the 20th century. And that's uh, this, this entangling of uh, these elementary particles uh, in, a, in what they call a quantum state. Uh, if you look up entangle and quantum on Google, it'll explain more if you want to know because I'm not a very good exp explainer of these things. But basically, they have managed to recreate uh, an interaction between one of these particles and another particle uh, a certain distance away where they can actually show that one influences the other without any physical connection at all. And theoretically, they could have a particle on the moon and a particle down on Earth, and they would interact at exactly the same time without the delay of the speed of light. So it's like matter and antimatter? Well, they're, they're like um, photons, just light, light particles. Uh, and, but where it normally it would take, let's say if, if it was on the moon, it would take uh, several seconds for a signal to get to Earth. These happen instantaneously. And so that violates a law of physics. Now, is that a miracle? Not really, but it's, it's quantum uh, physics, and nobody understood anything about that uh, before the 20th century. And we don't understand much about it now. And one of the links I posted earlier on the uh, 2GAB uh, Facebook website was a, a gentleman on the TED Talks talking about that. It's very interesting how he's, he's basically saying that how do we know uh, the difference between a miracle and, and some insufficiently advanced or some sufficiently advanced technology. That goes to my favorite quote from Arthur Clarke is, uh, there's really no difference between magic and a sufficiently advanced technology. So what that 
the, the conclusion you can reach from that is you can say this is a miracle or you can say that this is providence or you can say that this is something just unexpected. How do we know that that wasn't from God? How do we know that that didn't have a supernatural occurrence? But if you say that there's no, or I guess this person from TED Talk said that there's no difference between um, magic and you know advanced technology or whatever, the Bible clearly says that all magic is from the devil. So how would you it, it talks about sorcery, and I use the word magic just uh, in the terms of signs and wonders. Right. And we, the Bible actually warns us that about that. You know, there, you can't tell the difference between sometimes false miracles and true miracles. And how do we know the difference as believers in the Bible? I think what I what I've been seeing a lot lately is that skeptics are using quantum physics, string theory, multiverse theory. They're using it in the same way that they accuse believers of using the God of the gaps. They don't want to attribute anything to a divine being that they can't explain. So they say, oh, it's just quantum mechanics. Or it's, We're going to figure that out. We started to figure it out. Right. This happened before. They're just using it the same way that they say we use God of the gap. That's a really good observation. And it, it betrays their ph philosophical background, their, their naturalistic point of view. Um, and philosophers have grappled with this for centuries, believe it or not. Um, Spinoza... Uh, Basically, uh, he argued against miracles. Um, he said, basically, nothing happens contrary to the eternal and unchangeable order of nature. Miracles don't suffice to prove God's existence. Biblical miracles are just natural events. And the Bible often uses metaphorical language, there's that word again, uh, con concerning natural events so that these appear naturalist. And it's very understandable, uh, given the technology that we have today, you know, we start to, uh, I think we, we, we can start to play God in some ways with our technology uh, if we start taking this uh, naturalistic worldview as we feel like it's either something we can do or should be able to do or will be able to do shortly. And that's a dangerous pit to fall in, okay, because it, it says nothing about what the intent of that occurrence was, who it's pointing to, and what the source is. Uh, so Spinoza, even though he was a, a theist, he felt like uh, nature was the same thing as God's will. And that's basically what, where natural, a lot of natural theology came in. And that's the danger with natural theology, which is one of the things I pointed to before. The good thing about it is, yes, the heavens declare the, the glory of God, and, and his handiwork, but also, you know, they can, uh, they can also say that uh, there is, n is nothing more to God than nature. And that limits God. That reduces God to a part of nature. Uh, David Hume is another famous philosopher who talked about uh, uh, the, uh, he actually uh, attacked the possibility of identifying a miracle. He said that you can't identify a miracle just based on the fact that it's wondrous. You know, we, we, can, we can go to any episode of America's Got Talent or somebody and see a, a magician performing things that look miraculous. And we know, because we have a little more sophisticated philosophy than people that lived 3,000 years ago, we, we know there's probably some mechanistic way he did it. And it's probably the same way the sorcerers did it, when in fact, it could really, you know, Moses doing it could have been really a suspension of natural law. So the more sophisticated technology gets, the more dangerous it is to assume that a miracle happened. And again, we have to go back to the Bible and look at what is the purpose of miracles? Why are miracles there? What's God's reasoning? What was Jesus doing when he, when he showed a miracle? So uh, David Hume, he, he said you can't, discount nature as an explanation and that no testimony could be rely enough that it could establish a miracle has taken place that's more likely than just a natural occurrence. He said natural occurrences appear all the time with signs and wonders and things that we're amazed by and they're a lot more likely explanation than a divine intervention. And he struggled with that 
not only because he had kind of a naturalistic philosophy, but it's, it's kind of like Occam's razor, too. He said, that's the simplest explanation. You know, we understand more about nature than we could ever possibly understand about metaphysics. He also said, we don't even know if we have a mind. Yeah. There's these. Yeah, there's these existential ideas, and I actually had a whole class prepared on philosophy, which I didn't want to use today, <laughs> but it would, it it just sends you spinning, and it'll send your teenagers spinning too if they get uh, some introductory philosophy classes. They'll start wondering, why have I believed everything that I believe? Look at all these other things, that, and there's been hundreds of years of people really thinking deep about this stuff, you know. It's something you got to be ready for <coughs> when that comes. Um, so, uh, according to, to this idea, miracles, if not a result of chance, are caused by either man or some other mortal intelligence. Um, that's, that's the idea about, and then again, with Clark's insufficient or sufficiently advanced technology. Uh, a lot of scientists who couldn't explain something because they have a naturalistic worldview, they attributed things to intelligence, but to some other intelligence, some far away uh, alien civilization that's far in advance of us. In, in fact, there's a, a quite famous scientist that everybody kind of started to diss after, you know, this was about 40 years ago. He was trying to figure out how uh, life came on Earth. It was Fred Hoyle, I guess. He'd done the calculations of chance to figure out how much was. What's it, what are the chances that life appeared on Earth spontaneously? Uh, and he came to the conclusion that it just couldn't happen by t chance. So what was his answer? Aliens brought it here. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that, that not only got him a lot of derision in the scientific world, but it, philosophically it just postponed the problem of origins to some other place. Well, how did the aliens get it? Okay, you're in that pro progression of causes, the cosmological argument, and back you are again. Um, so, if an event has a po it's always other aliens, e e other aliens, okay. Forever, always. Uh, yeah, but we know that the universe has a boundary, so it can't be forever, okay. Other aliens. <laughs> yeah. So, if an event has a possible natural explanation, is it a miracle or is it providence? Um, that's a really good question. Because. The miraculous is that the providence had it in the timing it came for the purpose it served. Absolutely. No, I agree with you on that one. So, to some extent, it's a dead end to try to figure out if something is miraculous or providence. Or even if some kind of supernatural intervention in a natural process, or just it's a natural process, Everything keeps going back to this regression of causes, and somewhere, if you're a theist, God has to have a hand in that. And it's really not an argument about whether there is a God or not. It's just that how did God do it or when did he do it? And theists don't seem to have a problem with that. It's the skeptics that have a problem with that. I think what she hit on is the, the big deal for skeptics is it's accountability. They want to explain everything Mm -hmm. Without accountability, right? And we accept God, and so we accept His accountability. Mm. So, the uh, the conclusion that one can reach is, it's not the fact that a miracle happened or that the miracle was ever intended is kind of some kind of proof. It's like you start to have to think, why did the miracle happen, and why do miracles happen sometimes, and not? other times. You know, what are the circumstances around a miracle? Again, every, every instance of a, of a Bible miracle, I would challenge you to find anything in Scripture that describes a miracle that doesn't have a purpose or a reason or some kind of a, you know, a God-sourced message to get across through that miracle. So, I think... Um, from my point of view, I've made it clear that the acceptance of the supernatural pretty much depends on your worldview, whether you, whether you have a philosophy. It doesn't depend on whether you believe something can be proven or not. It just kind of depends on where you're coming from. Um, Woody Allen once famously said, 
if God would give me some clear sign like making a large deposit in my name at a Swiss bank, all right, uh, I, there, there's an article that was written by uh, William Dembski, who's also the, one of the intelligent design guys, and he calls them, calls him out, and he says, would God have taken Alan seriously? What if God had taken Alan seriously? Like, what if all of a sudden five million dollars showed up in Woody Allen's Swiss bank account that couldn't be explained? What would you think if you were Woody Allen? Bank error. Yeah, bank error. Amazing coincidence. Someone trying to trick him. Someone's trying to trick him. Someone's trying to get me to believe in this, you know, old man in the sky that I don't really believe in. You know, it's a lot. He'd go back to Occam's razor. You know, the simplest explanation is most likely the the, the correct one. Well, the argument's been made also that even if God appeared before someone saying, "Here I am," and it was all over, they say, "I'm hallucinating." Mm -hmm. You know, there's always this proclivity to go back to naturalistic hope. So, is it right or wrong to pray for miracles? Is that I have an answer to that. Is that testing God? Or yeah, is that that's a good question for the class. I have an answer to that, and I'll tell you what it is, but I want to hear from some other people. Is it wrong to pray for a miracle? I don't think it's no. wrong to pray for a miracle. God says, if you want something, if you truly want it, He'll, he'll allow you to have, He'll give it to you. You know, so long as you're faithful and loving and living in the spirit he'll give you the desires of your heart but you'll find that the desires of your heart are not what they were when you were living in the flesh so if you're truly desiring for a miracle to you know save a family of non-believers you know that seemingly have nobody in their life to bring them hope like it's not wrong to pray that god will miraculously intervene in their favor very well but like you said with John 6, 30, it can be wrong if you're preoccupied with that miracle and that you become consumed with the thought of seeing the next miracle. Mm -hmm. and, Expecting it. And, yeah, and like, expect like God owes it to you right. or yeah. something. Well, and then how's that different from the Pharisees, you know, who said, <laughs> you know, show me. Yeah, exactly. It's not the attitude of rejecting the answer, like mm -hmm. accepting God's will, yep. whether it's answered the way you want mm -hmm. yes. or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yep. And, and you're right, God sometimes says no. And it's about being according to God's will. You know, God will give you the desires of your heart. And the presumption is that the desires of your heart are aligned with God's will. That was the Sunday this morning. Okay. Yeah. For every miraculous healing that you read about or hear about, you know, there are dozens, hundreds of families yeah. that have probably also been praying yeah. for miraculous mm -hmm. healings that didn't occur. Mm -hmm. and, right, but those those trials that they're going through could have another miracle somewhere else. Well, look, look at Paul's example. Of all people, you'd think that God, yeah. he's going to... Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't his will. Exactly. Why don't you... God, I mean, who, who more qualified than God to pray for somebody to remove the thorn from his side? And God never did. And he actually com complained about it, quote unquote, or, you know, he made sure that people knew about it. Hey, look, I've been praying for this for a long time and God hasn't seen fit yet. Well, and, then, and yet <coughs> God did do miraculous things with Paul when Paul wasn't necessarily asking right. for it. When they were exactly. singing the praise songs and the gates of the prison opened up. Yeah. So, that's a, that's a great lead in. <coughs> and there's a, there's a, um, a skeptical argument that says if prayer were true, we should be able to scientifically figure out how it works. All right? And I'm trying to understand the will of God with science. Yeah. That's not going to Well, or, or the other thing is that you're discounting God's sovereignty. Right. You know, that God makes a decision to, to do whatever he does. And, you know, it's, it's our relationship with God in a sense that, where we understand the outcome of it. Uh, it's not about a mechanistic way of, if you put your hands on somebody's head and you call the elders in the church and they pray over you, this will happen. There's some cause and effect. There's some mechanical trigger that happens that God has to you know, maybe stop whatever he's doing and answer that prayer because you did it the right way. And that's the problem I have with the the kind of the TV preachers that where people come up on the stage with all the all the wheelchairs and crutches and everything and 
you know, they put their hands on their head and they fall back and the crutches fly away and they get up and they dance around, you know. It's, it's kind of showmanship. And does that do our God any favors? I don't, I don't think so. To answer your question, on the other hand, I think it's always right to pray for miraculous healing. It's always right. And the reason I think that is who are we to judge what God's will is and how are we to know? I have not seen a miraculous healing in my life that I knew was directly from God. Now, I do have, I do have some pretty miraculous uh, providential healings. And I was going to mention one. My, I have uh, eczema on my fingers. And I found this new product <laughs> that they, they rub on my fingers, and it goes away like miracles. And I, to me, that's a miracle, you know. But it's a sufficiently advanced technology. And, but I still give God credit for it. If God wants to heal me using this cream, or if he just wants to, you know, see everything that's white on my skin go away, just after a prayer in five seconds, either way, I'm healed and I'm happy. And I will give God credit for it. The greatest miracle is someone getting saved. That's right. Amen. And, That's right. And we pray for people's salvation yep. all the time. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, and how do we know we don't really care how that miracle happens? You know, it may happen like it did with me through 10 years of thinking about it and, you know, weighing this and weighing that and listening to really smart people and listening to not so smart people and reading and you could say that was an entire naturalistic process but Renee would tell you that's just as miraculous as any other way because I was that was pretty far out Sometimes the other way it comes through a really difficult struggle like the loss of a child or loss of a loved one because you, mm -hmm. you get so low that you have nowhere else to turn but to God and you better believe that he used that trial in your life to bring you to him yeah. he knew exactly what it would take not saying that he wanted to rip that person from you but you know sometimes that's that's how he works it's to the holy spirit god's pursuing you he pursues mm -hmm. every person mm -hmm. it's how you responded it took you 10 years but you responded and right. and we accept those things as miraculous and and direct result of god but how do you explain that to a skeptic Okay, how does, how does a skeptic know it's not just a delusion? You don't always have to explain things. I think by living the image of Christ in your own life, you can, I mean, you'll bring skeptics to their knees because they're well, eventually going to get to the point where they see this light in you that right. cannot be explained. And they get to a point where they want what you have. So they may throw everything that they believe and everything that they've studied out the window and start from scratch, start on their knees. And... I, I agree with that. Um, the it, it kind of doesn't really make a difference about the how in that case. It's really the why that makes a difference to people. Um, a skeptic is probably not going to believe, even if you know God puts seven thousand dollars in his bank account. You know, even if God comes down out of, off of the mountain and makes his face shine and gives him ten commandments. You know. What's to say that a skeptic isn't going to be building those, you know, golden calves at the bottom of the hill? Uh, it has, to, it, and the main point, and this is this is actually a really important point and a good one to kind of wrap up this whole session, is that regardless of your explanations and how skillful you are with your defense of Christianity, it's only going to help satisfy a person who's questioning that. It's not going to convert them. That is done by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we have to trust that God will employ any means possible for those that are his elect. But that we can definitely and we should want to be part of his agents. And just like we want to pray for somebody for miraculous healing, we want to be a part of any kind of a, uh, a, a, a lost soul's life to help them be brought back from that, uh, from that cliff. So lastly, I just want to wrap up. Um, even if we got to the point where we could say, okay, I'm comfortable that most things that happen nowadays are not miracles. They're, they're, they could be explained in some natural way and that, yeah, God intervened 
you know, a long time ago in the formation, formation of the universe, and we start becoming deists, there's this one big miracle that happened about 2,000 years ago that we can't discount, all right? And that's the resurrection. And I had a, a lot of material about that. Uh, whether or not miracles happen today or not, which is actually my mes next question. Some people believe miracles happen today. Uh, the church tradition I came from uh, a while ago said that, no, they don't happen anymore. They ceased at the end of the first century. That's just their, you know, they, they were kind of influenced by David Hume, I think. But uh, whether you believe either way about miracles today, there was a undeniable miracle that happened 2,000 years ago. And the people who witnessed it, they're, they were unassailable in their testimony about that being a miracle. And God foresaw through whatever means, supernatural or providential, that that information got to us today. And that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so regardless of where we figure on miracles, we have to accept that as a miracle as part of the fundamentals of the Christian faith. That's part of orthodox belief. Now, you'll find that there's a lot of organizations, including some modern churches, uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a movement called the Historical Jesus, where they're all about trying to explain things in a naturalistic way because they can't swallow this miracle. And as you'll remember, the same kind of arguments against Jesus' resurrection that you hear about today were being circulated way back then at the very time. They were trying to explain, well, somebody stole his body. Well, he swooned. You know, if you want to read more on this, uh, Lee Strobel wrote a good book, uh, The Case for Christ, where they talks about all of these theories. Uh, <clears throat> it's on a very easy reading level. It's, anyway, it's a good way to kind of cover all those arguments. They made a movie about it, too. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and that may have been on, you know, this TV show that I was talking about, The Great Mysteries of the Bible. You know, what happened to Jesus? Well, he, he fainted. He, you know, all of these things happened. They carried him out. And even if it was true that something happened that had a natural explanation, is it still not a miracle? I would submit to you that it's a miracle that Jesus was raised from the dead. If we got the technology at some future time to raise people from the dead. We're, you know, we're kind of close now. You see, you know, they put the paddles on you. You know, you've been dead for five minutes or whatever. They do CPR. But even if we got to some point in some time where we were able to do like raise Lazarus from the dead after you'd been decaying for four days, would that be a miracle to us? It might be. You know, where did that ability come from? You know, that came from God. If you, if you have a worldview like I have that God is responsible, he's the responsible party for whatever you see, that all the things that are good, it, it wouldn't matter. Go ahead. Uh, pertaining to the, the great deception and as far as uh, science advancing to the point where we could raise people from the dead or even keep people from dying, it is in the Bible that the day will come when men will wish for death and they will, it will not come. So there is, I think, at some point going to be some technology, maybe nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it seems like we're on the precipice of it now uh, with nanotechnology being able to, you know, heal. They can grow organs, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so just be, be mindful of that. So, again, the reason, for, the reason behind such an amazing sign and wonder is what is the purpose of it, you know? Does it, does it have those purposes that biblical miracles did? Uh, <clears throat> if we were able to raise somebody from the dead after they were rotting, if we were to do things like teleportation, if we were to do these other things that seem like magic today, um, it's not unlike curing leprosy, you know. I, I would suggest that it's, it, n it does not lessen the impact or the meaning or the source of the miracle of Jesus raising, raising from the dead. And on the other hand, like you said, uh, Luke 16.30 uh, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, remember that? He said, no father, Abraham, if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not even be convinced if somebody rises from the dead. So even if we're able to do that, we may not convince a skeptic. Well, it's not our job to convince them. Exactly. It's the Holy Spirit. 
Well, I have my cousin, is when he dies, he's going to be frozen. So when they come back with medical technology to unfreeze him and fix him, and you pay, pay a lot of money to be frozen oh, yeah. dead, um, then he'll be uh, one person again. He'll be okay. Um, just been praying and praying for him. I'm, I'm kind of skeptical <laughs> the, of that. I think it's called, uh, I think it's called cryo cryogenic cryogenic. Yeah, preservation. Yeah. Does yeah. he have physical illness, or this is just when he dies? Well, he, 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 he's, he's older. He's probably 89. Oh, okay. and he, but he, he's been wanting to do this for a long time. But my, my cousin, who he's, he's, they're married. She's a believer. She's not having any part of that. But you have her in that too. Oh. He's already paid for her to be frozen. Wow. So she's like, I don't want to be frozen. I know I'm good with God. So. so to, to wrap up a little bit, uh, I'm actually going to give this to you. Uh, I've got a couple more copies of this. This is a story that was published in Time about probably 20 years ago, 1995, uh, about Elizabeth Jernigan. And it's about her parents, uh, how she was cured of a brain tumor. And it's anyway, it's a very interesting story. Uh, the other one is one that you can still find on Breakpoint's website called Men as Trees Walking. And this is a, uh, a story about a man who was, who uh, uh, Oliver Sacks, I don't know if you remember him, the musicophilia guy, the guy that described the man who thought he was a hat and all these other, he describes all these weird kind of brain uh, conditions and, and injuries where it makes people, you know, get their wires crossed where they can see sounds and they can hear colors and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> In a book called Anthropologists on Mars, he describes a man named Virgil who has been blind since childhood. At the age of 50, he underwent surgery to restore his sight. What he experienced afterward inadvertently confirmed the Bible's account of Jesus' miracles. Following the surgery, Virgil suffered from what is called post-blind syndrome, the ability to make sense of the panorama of colors and shapes that crowd into our field of vision. As Sachs writes, Virgil would pick up details, an edge, an angle, a color, a movement, but he would not be able to synthesize them uh, to form a complex perception at a glance. For example, when looking at a cat, Virgil would see a paw, a nose, a tail, or an ear, but he couldn't see the cat. It took time and practice, but eventually he studied a tree and finally learned how to put it together. Uh, as his wife put it, he knows now that the trunk and leaves go together to form a complete tree. These words ought to ring a bell for any <coughs> Christian who understands the New Testament. The story of Virgil bears an uncanny resemblance to the story of the blind man of Bethsaida. In the Gospel of Mark, we read that Jesus led the blind man out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he said, Do you see anything? What did he say? I see men as trees walking. As Keith Mano writes in the National Review, this phrase is not just a poetic image, it's a clinical description. Like Virgil, Bethsaida men can now see the Bethsaida man can now see, but he can't make sense of what he's seeing. The tree and man run together, as did the tree trunk and the tree top for Virgil. In short, this is vir irrefutable evidence that a miracle did occur at Bethsaida, because Jesus had to heal the man again so that he could see things normally. So anyway, I just thought that was really interesting. And who knows, you know. I, I say you're kind of wasting your time if you're trying to figure out if something is a miracle or if something is providence because it doesn't really matter in the end. So thank you for uh, bearing with me all this time and uh, looking forward to coming back and studying Revelation with the rest of you. Thank you. <clears throat>